<laughs> Sorry about that. Roger, over to you. Okay. I've got a clip, got it here at the moment, I think. Well, uh, good evening and uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I have to say at the outset that um, I have a problem with the um, upstairs lighting circuit is blown. Mice have eaten through the cables in the loft. So if I have a rather ghostly appearance, that's the reason why. Um, this talk tonight uh, will be sort of the, the uh, obverse of the talk that we had earlier in the year when we looked at French species, which had a, a very clear connection with British species. Um, this talk will focus on the uh, more unusual and exotic uh, species, mostly of southern France. So many of these species, if your experience is basically UK based, uh, may not may not look too familiar to you. Um, <coughs> into context, um, France has 237 mainland species, plus about eight Corsican endemics, uh, which have evolved separately. Um, I'm on something of a mission to see all 237. Um, I'm up to 235, and of course, I'm not completely obsessive about the two I haven't seen. Um, however, uh, just crossing the channel, you, the butterflies that you'll see there are not that much different from the butterflies you'll see in Britain. Uh, a lot of northern France is very agriculturalized, <clears throat> and really you need to travel south to around uh, a couple of hundred miles south before you start seeing species that are not uh, essentially English. Um, this would be very much a meander through France, just looking at interesting species. Um, and basically, you'd have to travel pretty much to Dijon, about a third of the way down, before you start seeing species which are appreciably different from the ones that you're familiar with. <clears throat> um, on the cover here, we've got, as we noticed, um, Lesser Purple Emperor, where I've, I've sort of caught it halfway between purple and brown uh, on the left hand side, a purple emperor on the right, and the magnificent Poplar Admiral uh, on, the, on the right hand side. Um, and this is one case, I think, where an admiral definitely outranks an emperor. Um, On to some slides. Um, we we'll start with um, two blues, about the same size as common blues, and they're sort of twins. So I suspect that they probably uh, have only split in evolutionary terms relatively recently. Prevent Provence short-tailed blue and short-tailed blue. Um, the Provence, Provencal short-tailed blue uh, occurs in um, southwest of France, northern Spain, Italy and the Balkans, basically almost everywhere except Provence, uh, according to Tolman and Lewington. But I have actually seen it on occasions in the southern French Alps. Um, it's a butterfly that seems to be, that was rare and is, seems to be spreading across France uh, in terms of its distribution and in terms of its numbers. Um, the um, <clears throat> short-tailed blue is uh, a, a butterfly of Central Europe, which um, is pretty widespread in France, but its range does seem to be shrinking and it does seem to be encountered less frequently. Nobody really quite knows why. Um, as you can see, the males here on the left, Provencal at the top and short-tailed at, at the bottom, very, very similar. The females are quite different in that uh, the, the female of Provence short-tailed is almost devoid of any blue scales and uh, the female short-tailed is uh, rather appealingly has this spattering of blue scales. Um, they're quite difficult to tell apart in the field but if you see the undersides there is a clear distinguishing feature in that uh, as you can see if I yep is this going to fly in? Ah it has flown. Um, <clears throat> These uh, orange, for short-tailed blue, it has these orange lunules in this sort of marginal area, area of the hind wing, um, whereas Provence short-tail has no orange lunules in that area at all. Um, short-tailed blue did have a connection with the UK, with England. Um, it was seen around the area of Bloxworth in the late 1800s, and in fact, at that time, uh, was actually known as the Bloxworth blue. Um, when I was young, I went to Bloxworth but uh, had a good look around, but I have to say I didn't see any. Um, there have been records in Dorset since. Um, these may be releases, they may be uh, sort of 
uh, accidental escapes from uh, uh, bred species. Um, you probably recognize checkered skipper, um, top left and uh, the underside top middle. Um, <clears throat> it became extinct in England in 1976. Uh, surviving in Western Scotland and apparently being discovered in a number of previously unknown locations. And I think it has something like about 10 core sites in Scotland at the moment. Um, it was reintroduced in um, Northamptonshire a few years ago at a secret location uh, in the Rockingham Forest. And um, that introduction progressed very well. And uh, hopefully it will spread to uh, other sites uh, because it's a rather sedentary species. I believe that the site at Rockingham Forest um, has, has established itself to the level where you can uh, people can actually visit it. I think it's um, a place called Fine Shade Wood, and I think it's possible to actually uh, visit the site and see uh, checkered skippers there for the first time for what um, forty five years in England. Um, <clears throat> It tends to be an upland species in France, mostly at around a thousand meters altitude, um, generally not found in the south other than the Pyrenees. Uh, some of these distributions of species in France are really quite uh, difficult to explain. Top right, we have the large checkered skipper, um, which is um, uh, similar in uh, certain respects in terms of the underside. Uh, it's it's described as large, but it, frankly, it's probably no more than 10% larger than the checkered skipper anyway. Uh, and clearly this is not a UK species. Um, it's a species that um, has this very, has a very appealing underside with these sort of uh, white areas uh, ringed in black on a very pale yellow background. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it's uh, the unusual thing about large checkered skipper, which is a butterfly very much of the, uh, uh, central and western France is that um, it has a very strange flight. It's a very much a bobbing flight. It sort of bounces up and down. I tend to think of it as the only butterfly that would have been designed by Barnes Wallace. Um, on the bottom line, we have uh, on the left and in the middle, nettle tree butterfly. Um, it's very unusual shaped wings, uh, this, uh, this species. It's the only species in Europe of the, uh, the family Libithia in, in Europe. And uh, there, are, there are several species that are the only representative of the, the family in Europe. Um, Duke of Burgundy um, of the family uh, Riodinidae being another. But um, it's named after the um, larval host plant, nettle tree, which is a relatively small tree. It's generally, uh, uh, grown as, a, as an ornamental tree, uh, quite often in town centres in France. So you quite often see it in town centres. Um, but the butterfly itself, as you can see from the open wing shot there, that's actually on a nettle tree. It's one of these species that's very much glued to the uh, larval host plant. Um, <clears throat> on the bottom right, we have uh, a very uh, appealing butterfly, uh, woodland brown. Um, the, uh, the only species of the, uh, the genus Lepinga, certainly in France, uh, there may be others in Europe, but it has this, it's um, a satyrid uh, and it has this beautiful ringed underside. It's um, very localized in France, in central France, uh, with a number of dis uh, widely distributed uh, colonies that are widely separated. Um, when you do see it, however, uh, you, it can be encountered in very large numbers. Uh, there's one spot near Lyon where I see it regularly at the end of May, beginning of June, and uh, it's possible to count at least 100, but they're incredibly nervous and very difficult to photograph. And they have this weird habit of flying straight into bushes, not around them, straight into them. Um, so um, the, opportunities for photographing it are uh, limited to when it's on the ground. It's on some form of um, uh, animal excrement here. I'm not an expert. Uh, it may be badger, but uh, that's about the only time you can get close to them. Um, next up, we have two um, fritillaries, scarce fritillary on the left and Asian fritillary on the right. 
Um, they're close relatives, as you can probably tell from the pattern of um, marsh fritillary, uh, similar pattern. Um, and again, this is another sort of couplet, another a pair of um, species which are, uh, are clearly closely related. But the scarce fritillary is a very much a lowland species, and the Asian fritillary is a species seen at 1800 meters and above. Quite how they've diverged in terms of altitude is, is something of a puzzle, but they're both essentially uh, Central European species with their distributions just uh, spilling into East and Central France, where they're quite rare and, uh, and, and quite localized. So for once the scarce name in the uh, scarce protrudery is actually quite, uh, quite accurate. You can see the similarities in the upper sides, um, but when you look at the two undersides, which I think are quite breathtakingly beautiful undersides, uh, you can see that these clearly uh, originated um, from, the, uh, from the same beginnings. Um, next up, we have um, uh, map butterfly on the left. Uh, <clears throat> this is um, probably one of the first butterflies you would encounter as you travel south. Um, probably around 12, about 250 miles south of Calais. Um, it's a very unusual butterfly in that uh, it has uh, two broods, uh, two seasonal forms. The one above is the summer brood and the one below is the spring brood. Uh, the one below <coughs> uh, emerges in April or May, produces the summer brood, which is the uh, form prosa above. Uh, <coughs> and then that cycle continues. Um, the spring brood looks very much like a small fritillary or a small tortoiseshell, and the summer brood looks rather more like a white admiral. But I think the early entomologists uh, who first encountered this were fairly convinced that they were two separate species. And to be perfectly honest, looking at them, who can blame them? Um, there was an attempt in um, uh, just over 100 years ago, I think about 1912, uh, when an entomologist thought this would be a very nice addition to British species to introduce map from the continent into the forest of Dean. Um, but the introduction of non-native species was as controversial then as it is now, probably just as controversial, and uh, an entomologist who objected quite violently to this uh, collected them all and uh, within the space of a couple of years had wiped them all out, and that was the end of the brief sojourn of the map butterfly in Britain. Um, it's a butterfly that occurs right across Europe. It's, it's really quite widespread, but uh, doesn't occur in the southeast corner of France, in Provence. And given that um, the area of Provence is incredibly rich, there are a number of species that just don't occur there at all, and that's really quite a mystery. On, on the right, we have um, uh, the two uh, iconic festoons, the Southern festoon at the top and the Spanish festoon uh, below. Uh, and these really are quite breathtaking when you see them uh, in the field. I remember the first time in April 2005 that uh, I saw a Southern festoon and, and we just really watched it transfixed for a couple of hours, never seen anything like it before. Um, the southern festoon is a species of essentially Greece and Italy, and if you were to fill up the sort of European distribution map with black ink, it would fill up Italy and Greece and then spill into uh, southeastern France. And similarly with the Spanish festoon, that's an Iberian species, and if you filled up Iberia, it then just spilt over into um, southwestern, south central France. And in the um, south central France, where I spend several months of the year, um, we're lucky enough to be able to see both species. Um, slightly um, uh, unusual in that uh, both of these species use species of um, birthwort as the larval host plant. Um, birth, birthwort is as a plant, it's just about as unappealing as it sounds. Um, the um, southern festoon uses um, Aristolochia rotunda, and the, the, the Spanish festoon uses Aristolochia uh, pistolochia. But it's surprising that um, 
a plant that's as unappealing to look at can produce butterflies that are so incredibly intricate and beautifully marked. Um, <clears throat> next, uh, on the left, we have um, the Eyeless Blue. It's actually the, the largest European blue, although putting that into context, it's not that much larger than that, the large blue itself. So it's only fractionally larger. Uh, it's the only representative of this genus in Europe and it's quite scarce and localized in southern France. Um, it's um, a uh, larval host plant is bladder senna, um, Colletea arborescens, and its um, uh, life cycle is, is very much uh, synchronized with the development of the bladders. The one above is actually a female, which has rather more blue in it than uh, the most female blues. And the one below is a very freshly emerged female with this very attractive sort of ghosted markings around the margin. Um, on the right, we have uh, a checkered blue, which is quite a small blue, slightly smaller than the common blue. Um, that's a female above and uh, the underside uh, below. Uh, I think it's a particularly beautifully marked underside uh, with these very bold black spots and this very appealing um, sort of crown of orange thorns that, that very carefully uh, dissect the black spots without touching them. I always find this quite a bizarre element of uh, uh, undersides, especially of blues, where the, the markings very carefully don't touch each other. Um, the female above... Uh, is uh, that it's said that there can be blue females with a greater spattering of, of blue scales, uh, although normally they're not anywhere near as blue as this one, but this is an unusually blue female. Um, and the, um, the larval host plant is, uh, is white stonecrop uh, seed and album, but um, it's quite a uh, uh, localized species of Southern France. Um, one of my favourite um, uh, families is the, the heath family. Uh, we have two of them in Britain, the ubiquitous uh, small heath and, uh, and the large heath. Uh, I have to say that the early entomologists who named them didn't uh, produce too much imagination in terms of the name. So many of these things are large and small. Um, on the left, we have uh, the dusky heath. And in France, there are nine species um, in this genus. And uh, the strange thing is that they've adapted to quite different forms of terrain. Some are alpine, some are adapted to lowland, cool, boggy areas. And the dusky heath is the one that's adapted to the southern, uh, hotter Mediterranean area. Um, but it's very appealing with these um, rather bold eye spots uh, or, or ocelli. And the form below is from, um, sort of a more central southern France around the department of Gard and um, uh, Aveyron with these much produced um, ocelli. The question of whether the ocelli have a purpose uh, is, is quite interesting, but I'll leave that to uh, the talk next month on uh, butterfly behavior. On the right, we have um, very appealing chestnut heath. Uh, quite widespread in southern France, and it gets its name from the, uh, the sort of chestnut brown. You can see it probably better on the um, um, forewing of the, uh, the one above. Um, it's, uh, it's said to have um, ocelli, and these ocelli can uh, vary enormously in, in size and shape. And the form below is the form botolis, which has no ocelli at all. Mm. Um, <clears throat> on to uh, some more of this heath family. I'm sorry if I'm overdosing on the heath, but I do find these particularly appealing. Um, top left, we have pearly heath, which is probably the commonest of the heaths. It's really quite widespread across France and Europe and really is quite appealing um, with these sort of red ringed ocelli. Um, it's a generally a butterfly of lowland areas uh, with... Um, uh, not occurring over about 1800 meters, but it's essentially a woodland species. Um, in the top middle, we have Darwin's heath, um, which is very similar to the pearly heath. Uh, it only occurs in the 
area on the border, uh, high altitude area of the Alps, on the border between France and Italy. And um, not too much is known about his origins, but it may well have just be a stabilized hybrid between um, Hurley Heath and Alpine Heath, which is uh, top right. Um, but um, it's uh, very similar to the Pearly Heath, but its main defining characteristic is that on the white band, you can see the white band tends to be more regular and is not sort of dentate or tooth shaped in the middle as uh, Pearly Heath is. Top right, we have um, Alpine Heath, which is the high altitude um, specialist, same altitudes as Darwin's Heath, really above 1800 meters. Very easy to identify because it's got these very strong black uh, ocelli, all of which were in the white band. Um, bottom left, we have a butterfly that is well named, Scarce Heath. It's a butterfly of the damp areas of eastern central France, very localized and um, very uh, uh, sought after, especially by collectors. Um, there is one famous location, which I have to say is. Um, patrolled by wardens and though if you are if you turn up in that area they will ask you uh, quite quizzically exactly what are you doing there um, in the middle we have um, one of the uh, uh, incorrectly named butterflies it's called false ringlet uh, because it is a member of the um, Cynonympha uh, genus not a ringlet as we know in the UK um, so it's not really a false anything. It was, uh, but these early names by the early entomologists went into the books and they've stuck ever since. Um, this is another butterfly that is uh, limited to damp, boggy areas. Its main stronghold is around Bordeaux, but there are a couple of um, locations in eastern central France around uh, near Grenoble. And I, that's where I took this photograph. Um, I was taken to a site by some researchers from the University of Grenoble um, to this site. Um, it was on a, a, a four day tour when I took my wife on a four day tour of the bogs of uh, central France. Um, I probably didn't plan it terribly well because those four days included our wedding anniversary. And um, to be honest, I don't ever remember actually she saying thank you for taking her, but, uh, but there you go. Bottom right, we have, um, large heath. Um, it's as scarce and localised in France and as threatened as it is in Britain. Um, there are a number of subspecies in Britain. Uh, the books don't seem to be entirely uh, consistent in terms of the, the, the naming of these subspecies, but the French species is Typhon, where the ocelli are said to be um, well developed, although uh, that really hasn't been my experience, isn't, isn't borne out by this photo. Um, in the British species, in Scotland, we have the, um, the subspecies Scotica, and uh, from Northern England, I think the species is Davis, and I think there are quite a number of intermediate forms. That's enough of the Heath family. Um, next, we move on to an even more greater nightmare, the dreaded family of Pyrgus. Uh, not a problem in Britain because we only have one, the grizzled skipper, uh, although obviously there are conservation concerns surrounding that. But in France, there are 15 of these species and they all look very similar. Um, they're um, like, rather like the heath, but not quite so extreme. Many of them have adapted to uh, different altitudes and, and different locations. Um, I've spent quite a lot of time looking at this group, um, even spending a couple of days at the um, in, down in the basement in the archives of the Natural History Museum, studying all of the trays of these to try and work out from the upper sides if there are any differentiating features. But it is extremely difficult. And it was made worse when one of the curators said to me, don't assume that the early entomologists labeled all of these correctly. Um, so on the left, we have Carline Skipper, which is a high altitude form. And I um, guess oh this is not so cool things working. That's the, supposed to be the key identifying feature is this rather C-shaped cell mark. Um, but these identifying features can be quite variable and um, other species can have cell marks within that level of variation. 
uh, the underside is below this rather sort of dark uh, chocolate brown. Um, in the middle, we have rosy grizzled skipper, which is a lowland species of southern France. Um, and um, that has an upper side which is very similar to many other species. But it's in most cases, it's the underside that are differentiating. And I've just circled there the, the sort of key mark of rosy grizzled skipper, this sort of central mark in the discal band. Um, which is often described in the books as anvil shaped, sort of wasted in the middle and often black edged. And on the right hand side, um, top and bottom, we have the yellow banded skipper, a, um, a species of southern, far southern France. And as you can see from the underside, its underside is completely different. These beautiful yellow bands, which contrast very nicely, uh, makes it, uh, gives it its name and uh, makes it almost impossible to confuse with any other species. Mm. Um, on to the um, Apollo family and people who go to the, uh, to the Alps for the first time, top of their wish list is always the iconic Apollo. Um, the Apollo uh, top left is the male Apollo and the, the female is below it. And, um, as is true of both the uh, Apollo and the small Apollo, the male is rather more crisply marked uh, than the rather diffuse markings of, of the female by and large. Um, it's a fantastic butterfly to see in the field. And I always tend to feel it rather floats rather than flies. Uh, never seems to put too much effort into to flying. Um, the small Apollo is also a high altitude specialist. Uh, that's the male top middle and the female below. Actually with the female is actually in copula with the male, if you can just see it end on below the female. <clears throat> um, it's, uh, it's not noticeably smaller than the, the Apollo, but as I say, these names like smaller, lesser and false tended to stick from the early entomologists. But um, the small Apollo is a, a species of high altitudes nearly always found by uh, rushing torrential rivers where the um, larval host plant, um, uh, yellow saxifrage uh, tends to grow. And the, the defining feature, given that they look very, very similar, is that um, the small Apollo has these red marks near the, uh, the forewing costa, uh, much clearer on the female, just about discernible on the male. It's not a very good example on the male above, but the Apollo itself does not have those red marks. Top right, we have um, small Apollo, the, the same mating pair as um, bottom middle with the, with the wings closed. So you can see that the, um, the, the female underside has this very much yellowish appearance. Um, bottom right is the clouded Apollo, the third member of this group. Um, in Europe and um, it tends to fly at sort of medium to high altitudes. Uh, in my experience, tends not to fly with either the Apollo or the small Apollo, um, but easy to uh, distinguish because the markings are different and it doesn't have any red markings at all. Um, On to another pair of blues, a bit like the Provence short-tailed and the short-tailed blue. These two are another um, sort of couplet of blues, which clearly have only separated relatively recently in evolutionary terms. Um, on the top row, the green underside blue, another rather misnamed blue in my opinion, because in my experience, only about 10% of them have any green on the underside at all. And um, the black eyed blue below, which is probably a little better named because the, the, the black markings tend to be rather bolder. <clears throat> um, the males are, are, are quite similar. The, the um, green underside blue is quite a bright blue, very similar to Adonis in many respects, um, but with a strong black border, which is much stronger at the apex. And the uh, black eyed blue below is very similar. The blue tends to be a rather more steely blue. Um, you can, after you've seen quite a few, you can actually tell this in flight. Uh, the two females are in the middle, green underside above and black eyed below. And they're actually really quite similar. Um, black eyed blue tends, tends to be smaller and the undersides are on the right. Um, the underside markings of the green underside blue on the hind wing are quite variable. Um, and uh, I believe even though I've got the, um, 
uh, the sort of little square for the um, uh, for the sort of sharing is, is obliterating this photo. I believe that the hind wing has got no green uh, uh, black markings on the hind wing there. So they really are quite variable. <clears throat> Um, this is a sample of um, some of the 30 odd species of Arabia ringlets. Um, and they're called ringlets. They're not actually the same family as the ringlet that we, we know in Britain. That's a, di uh, a different genus. Um, there, as I say, there's some 30 odd. We have two in Britain, the mountain ringlet and Scotch Argus. Um, but there are some 30 or so, and they are widely distributed. Many of them are highly localized. On the left, we have um, bright-eyed ringlet, um, upper side, which is not particularly bright-eyed, but is very similar to a number of other Arabia, but it gets its name from the, um, uh, the large ocelli of the underside below. And I think that's probably the female that we're looking at there. The Ottoman brassy ringlet is a very strange butterfly in that it only flies in France uh, around Mont Lozère in the Cévennes, and its main area is in the Balkans. And um, that's, I believe that Mont Lozère is the only place it flies outside of the Balkans. So how come they bec that became so uh, detached from its sort of core area is, is a mystery. But again, I'll leave that to the um, talk on behavior uh, next month. Um, below in the middle, we've got the mountain ringlet, which flies all across the, the Alps and the Pyrenees, several different forms, uh, uh, according to, to locality in the Pyrenees and the, the Alps in particular. Um, top right is the Aaron Brown. Um, although I can't see the photo, I believe this is a female, where the ocelli are rather larger than the male, as a rule, for Aaron Brown and one or two other Erebia. Um, it's called Aaron Brown, but personally, and I may be wrong on this, I have doubts as to whether it ever occurred in the Isle of Aaron or indeed anywhere in the UK. Um, I don't believe there are any pinned specimens to uh, substantiate that. Um, and I have the vague feeling that given that Scotch Argus females can have very large ocelli, that um, it may, what people have named originally as Aaron Brown, may well have just been a female Scotch Argus, but I could be wrong on that. <clears throat> um, bottom right is um, uh, Lefebvre's ringlet, named after the entomologist, Lefebvre, French entomologist Lefebvre. And um, it's, it's a Pyrenean uh, endemic. This is a rather unusual female in that uh, it doesn't really have any red in the sort of um, <clears throat> post-discal band surrounding the ocelli. And um, up until this year, I'd seen, uh, it, there were four species I hadn't seen. And in the Pyrenees, I managed to see the Gavani blue. And while I was there at this location in the Pyrenees, I noticed somebody who's here tonight, hello, Yelland, uh, who was intently photographing something. I didn't know what he was photographing. It could have been a plant or whatever, uh, some 20 or 30 meters away. And I, I asked, uh, what it was he was photographing. And he said, I think it may be a female Lefebvre's ringlet. And that was a life tick for me. And I have to say that the thought, please God, let him be right, uh, ran through my head and indeed it was. So thank you, Yelland, you have hero status in my eyes. Um, a few more um, of Erebia, just to show the, uh, the sort of variety. Uh, above, you've got yellow spotted ringlet, and it gets its name from the yellow markings on the underneath, not from the upper side. The upper side of the nominate form, which is the top left, is very similar to a number of other Erebia. Um, and strangely, it has this subspecies constants, which um, occurs in the Pyrenees, which is completely black and devoid of any markings at all. How these two can be related in the same species is really quite a puzzle. Um, top middle, we have the uh, jet black uh, sooty ring bit. There are two, two forms. This is the one without any red markings on the forewing. It's very high, probably the highest altitude species in France. And I took this photo at uh, 2,700 meters altitude 
up on the top of the uh, Col de la Bonnette, uh, where they fly up and down uh, rocky scree. Uh, you don't want to be following them, but occasionally they do settle, especially here when they're engaging in courtship, and that's a female just ahead of it. But you generally have to be quick at this spot to, to get the photographs because it's a favoured spot of bikers. And uh, when the bikers go thundering past a few yards away, uh, the, um, the, the ringlets don't hang about, so you have to be quick. On the right, we have another brown, which is a um, strange butterfly to me, the dryad. And um, this is a female with these large ocelli, which are blue ringed, which I think looks fairly, it's probably fairly unique amongst um, the, the satyrids in my experience, but uh, a rather strange looking butterfly sort of gives the impression of what butterflies might have looked sort of, um, you know, prior to the ice age. Um, on to a couple of more related blues now. Um, Glandon blue on the left. And Glandon blue is a relatively, relatively common high altitude butterfly, 2000 meters or so in the Alps. And sometimes you encounter it in, in quite large numbers, but it has this sort of um, quite variable slate blue color. And the underside is quite, uh, quite beautifully marked, delicately marked, completely unique. Um, on the right, you have the much rarer Gavani blue, which is limited to, in France, to an area around Gavani in the, in the Pyrenees. And uh, it has this um, very similar sort of blue coloration, but rather lighter. And the bottom right is the underside, and you can see that uh, the uh, Gavani blue and the Glandon blue are closely related from the similarities in the underside. Um, <clears throat> these are um, four examples of um, fritillaries of the uh, Militia uh, genus. Um, up until uh, a few years ago, there were sort of two groups, the Militia group, which included Glanville fritillary, and the Melicta group, which included the Heath fritillary. All of these on this page are uh, were erstwhile uh, Melicta species, but they've now been grouped together as uh, and renamed as Melitia. Top left is the Heath fritillary, which uh, UK people are going to find this hard to, to, to swallow, but it is actually extremely common in France. You see it almost everywhere. Um, quite why it should be so limited in Britain is, uh, is difficult to say. Um, below that, you have the very similar uh, related Nicole's fritillary, a butterfly of Central Europe, which just leaks into um, <clears throat> Central France, but is quite uh, scarce and localized, uh, limited number of localities. Top right is the Provençal fritillary, um, which is principally an Iberian species, uh, but spilling into the south of France. This is a female where the, um, you can see the clear co color contrast between the bands. Um, the male tends to be more orange throughout and as such is, is much more similar to the Heath fritillary. And bottom right is the high altitude specialist, uh, Grisson's fritillary, which flies at uh, around 2000 meters and above in the Alps. And I think in one spot in Switzerland. Um, moving on, another sort of couplet, um, which is a, a lowland upland uh, pairing of clearly related species. This is the bath white and the peak white. Um, the bath white uh, named because it was first seen in the uh, British city of Bath, possibly not seen there since. Uh, I think it's um, the number of sightings are either zero or very small in Britain ever since. Um, the male is top left with the uh, limited number of markings in the apical area. The female is top middle with, with rather more markings. And in fact, for females, this is rather more lightly marked than, than the norm. And um, top right, you have the underside, which actually looks like it's green. But if you look at it very closely, uh, it's actually a mixture of yellow scales and black scales, giving the appearance of being green. Um, on the bottom row, <clears throat> Uh, the peak white, very well named because it, um, it, it flies at uh, usually about 2,000 metres and above, uh, 
sometimes uh, considerably above. Um, I would like to have included a, a picture of the female peak white, but uh, as I've never seen one, that's a little bit tricky. Um, the females of a lot of these high altitude species tend to be really quite sedentary. They just stay in the area of the larval host plant and, uh, and, and don't wander terribly far from that. And bottom right, you have this rather attractive um, underside of the peak white with these rather sort of greenish, again, yellow and black scales making up this rather sagittate pattern. Um, these are um, four species of the um, uh, genus Vengaris, which used to be known, is probably better known as the uh, Maculinia species. Um, top left uh, is the Alcon blue. Um, this is a species that has an upland and a lowland form. This is the lowland form, the Alcon blue. The upland form is mountain Alcon blue. Um, and um, this is a butterfly of sort of damp areas, very localized in eastern France. And the, um, uh, they tend not to wander too far from the larval host plant. Uh, the female spends all of its time egg laying on uh, marsh gentian. The, uh, the mountain alcon blue, the larval host plant is uh, the uh, closely related uh, cross gentian. But that's a female above with a smattering of blue scales and a male underside below. Uh, in the middle is large blue. Uh, the, the black markings as you go higher in altitude tend to become heavier. Um, this is sort of halfway to the form uh, obscura with very heavy black markings. This was taken in um, the, the Pyrenees uh, at altitude. Um, and this is a female. It's the same butterfly top and bottom, which posed very obligingly. Um, top right is very well named scarce large blue because it is scarce. Uh, both the scarce large blue and the dusky large blue are butterflies basically of uh, Central Europe, both spilling into uh, Eastern France, Eastern Central France. And they both use um, uh, Great Burnet, um, uh, Sanguisorba officinalis as their larval host plant. And in fact, the dusky large blue there, the, uh, the mating pair are actually on the head of uh, Great Burnet, but um, they're both uh, very, very localized and, uh, and an awful lot of uh, conservation protection is going into uh, ensuring that, um, that, they're, that they're protected. Um, next, uh, you're probably familiar with the Queen of Spain Futuri. Um, I always felt this was my favorite butterfly but then I heard uh, a famous naturalist get asked, what's your favorite butterfly? And uh, he thought for a moment and he said, um, whichever one I'm looking at at the moment. So I thought that was a rather good uh, attitude to have. So uh, although the Queen of Spain is probably my favorite butterfly, so I, I try to adopt the uh, whatever I'm looking at at the moment attitude. Um, it um, has this beautiful, rather square shape with these bold spots, but the underside probably um, with these silvery mirrors is probably even more spectacular. But the strange thing about it is that since records began, there have been records, of, uh, given that it's highly migratory, there's only been 500 uh, records of it reaching British shores, but it has been uh, reaching the, uh, the sort of southeast coastline. And I think it might even have bred but whether it will become established really remains to be seen. Um, these are um, some blues from the widespread polyomatous uh, uh, genus of blues, which includes common blue and Adonis blue and, um, and Chalkhill blue. The iconic Maligas blue, male, top left, with this slightly serrated hind wing, which um, top middle is even more pronounced in the female. So it's completely unmistakable. Um, it's a butterfly of the southeast of France. Uh, the female has two forms, the allegedly uh, commoner blue form, but this is the, the brown form, which has the name um, Steveni. And the, um, the underside is, is top right with these rather attractive but sort of ghosted uh, markings, rather like the eyeless blue. Um, below left and Middle, we have the so-called furry blue, 
which is a um, butterfly of the, the far south of France, um, has this pale silvery blue upper side and underside, which is equally sort of pale. These two are taking salts from a sort of damp, muddy area, being very careful not to get their feet wet. Um, and bottom right, we have what is probably the, 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 the silliest named butterfly of all, Ripart's anomalous blue. It's a, there's a family of anomalous blues. Um, and the reason it's called an anomalous blue is because the upper side, even for the males, is brown. And I don't think you can get more anomalous than that. Um, on to some coppers now. And there are, there are seven species of copper in France. Um, these are the two with the most sort of metallic and reflective um, uh, upper sides. Uh, top line is purple shot copper. And again here, um, you have uh, two forms, the lowland uh, nominate form and the uh, alciphron and the upland form, gordius. And this is a male and a female in the middle of the um, upland form, gordius. And on the top right, we have the, the underside. Um, the, these copper, the coppers, especially the female, are quite large. And you see them in flight. Uh, you could easily mistake it for a small fritillary until, it, uh, until you get to see it clearly. On the bottom row, we have the iconic violet copper uh, with this um, metallic violet sheen. And it really is... Uh, photograph doesn't really do it justice. You have to see it in the field. Um, the female for um, <clears throat> uh, female of these Lysenid species is actually very appealing. And as you can see, uh, the, 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 the pattern is uh, almost uh, challenging the male for its sort of visual appeal. And the um, underside is uh, bottom right. Um, it's surprising that the violet copper is so scarce and localized. It's limited to certain areas in eastern central France or in central France with one small locality in the Pyrenees. Um, because um, its, its larval host plant is, mis, is bistort, uh, which you can see the underside is sitting on. And that's a very common uh, plant in, uh, in France, especially in sort of damp um, upland areas at about a thousand meters. So it's perhaps surprising that the violet copper um, isn't, uh, isn't a bit more widespread than it is. Um, two more coppers here on the top row, uh, large copper and the bottom row, scarce copper. <clears throat> um, the, on the left hand side, the, both of the males have this fiery red uh, upper side and they look very similar, but the, um, the scarce copper has these sort of uh, black dots around the, uh, the margin of the hind wing. But in practice, you're never going to confuse them because large copper is a uh, a lowland species of, uh, of damp areas, and the scarce copper is um, uh, very much an upland species, generally around 1300 meters plus, usually considerably higher. But uh, for these two coppers, the females are um, uh, really very appealing. And I personally think that the female scarce copper actually outdoes the male for its, uh, for its appeal. Um, it's not scarce at all in France, again, Another misnamed species, it was named originally by the uh, uh, presumably English entomologist because he thought it was scarce, but actually it's, um, it, it's pretty common and widespread across um, upland areas of, of France. Um, I've rather mixed up on some of my um, uh, images here. Some of them are, are top row and bottom row and some of them are left and right, so I apologize for that. Um, top row, we have the um, rather uninspiring uh, looking geranium bronze, um, upper side on the left and this rather fuzzy underside <clears throat> on the right. And it's sort of butterfly that when you take a photograph, uh, it doesn't matter how well you've got it focused, it looks out of focus by definition. Um, it's not actually uh, naturally occurring in France. It, um, it's pretty certain that it was imported accidentally on uh, imported pelagonums from, um, uh, from South Africa, obviously in the form of eggs, uh, into southern France. And um, given that um, geraniums are uh, 
incredibly popular in southern France, especially for window boxes. Uh, geranium bronze must have thought it landed in heaven and has been expanding its numbers and its range ever since, to the point where the horticulturalists of southern France consider it to be uh, a pest. And um, its range has now extended northwards um, up to Lyon, so it'd be interesting to see how far it goes in another 20 years. Um, on the bottom row, we have the rather um, small and delightful little blue silvery Argus, which is, is quite small. It's a butterfly of high altitudes. Um, you find it in most places, but rarely more than in, in ones or twos. Um, <clears throat> on to some more satyrids um, and um, reverting to the sort of top line, bottom line. The top line, we have the great sooty satyr, uh, which I think is a magnificently named butterfly. Uh, you always get the impression you can hear Carmina Burana playing in the background whenever you say it. Um, you don't often get to see the, the upper side because it generally settles with closed wings, but I was lucky enough to get open wing shots of the male on the left, and you can see how dark it is. And it actually does look quite strange when you see it in the field because it, it, it's a quite large and it's black. Um, the female is uh, slightly lighter again with much larger ocelli, uh, but you can see it's a very gravid female, no doubt in that one. And the underside top right. Uh, below that, uh, the, although the great city satyr is quite widespread and relatively common, sometimes you get it in quite large numbers. Uh, the black satyr, um, which um, is essentially uh, an Iberian species spilling into to southern France, um, is rather more localized. <clears throat> uh, and uh, it, um, the, the, given that the undersides of both are extremely variable, the, um, the one sort of key difference uh, is that um, on the discal band uh, here, um, for the black satyr, that is highly irregular and dentate and very sharp. And the, um, the, the line for great sooty satyr is, is similar, but is never quite as um, dentate as that. There's also uh, differences in, in terms of the um, number of uh, forming ocelli for the male, but that's not always crystal clear because you don't always get to see the forming uh, uh, clearly. Um, these are the, um, uh, the, the giants uh, of um, French butterflies. Um, <clears throat> The, um, the misnamed two-tailed pasha, which as you can see is uh, misnamed because it clearly has four tails. <clears throat> and it is a huge butterfly. It's the only uh, representative of the um, Caraxes genus in, in Europe. And is very much limited to um, Southern Europe and in France, the uh, extreme uh, Southern region, the sort of olive band. Um, it's, it's around six inches across uh, fully um, uh, wingspan. And uh, when you see it, you actually, for the first time, you think you're actually looking at a small bird. <clears throat> but it's a, it's a magnificent flyer. <clears throat> um, and the strange thing about it is that the larval host plant is a strawberry tree, um, which um, is uh, an awful lot of um, southern France. It's, it's, carpeted in strawberry tree and it shares that larval host plant with a butterfly with which has virtually no connection at all the chapman's green hair streak which is about the same size as a green hair streak so how strawberry tree can produce two species that uh, are so completely different is a bit of a mystery but the um, thing about tutel pasha is uh, uh, where we are in the southern france on on the south coast um it, uh, the Pasha has a taste for alcohol and uh, we don't understand what they need, but they certainly know what they need. <clears throat> and uh, it, uh, it, it, it has a taste for alcohol. It doesn't get drunk at all. <clears throat> so it's clearly taking something chemical from the alcohol that it needs probably for fertility or, or other purposes. Don't, don't quite know exactly. Um, but where we are in the south of France, what we do is um, to attract them is to mash uh, rum into, uh, into banana so the rum doesn't evaporate. And uh, 
we we leave that out in a sort of uh, open area um, where there are uh, no trees or foliage so that um, the uh, pashas can see all around because they're very concerned about predators because there's a lot of things in southern France that uh, consider butterflies to be a tasty snack. And um, the pashas can, uh, uh, when we're in southern France, the pashas can detect alcohol from a distance of about 20 meters, uh, which coincidentally is about the same range as our neighbors. Um, but they come down to <laughs> come down to the, um, uh, they sense the mixture and they will circle around and settle in a nearby tree and make sure there are no predators and it's absolutely safe. And when they're convinced that uh, there are no threats, it'll drop down to the, to the mixture and uh, put its proboscis. You can just see its proboscis there dropping down, uh, this thick black proboscis. Once they're engaged, they, as I say, they don't get drunk but they do become preoccupied and you can approach them quite closely. Uh, and um, I think the most we've ever had on one little um, uh, rum banana uh, mixture was, was four pashas at, at any one time. They don't have very good manners. They're always shoving each other out of the way. Um, below that um, is uh, the, the plain tiger. Uh, and this is my one sighting of the plain tiger because it's pretty scarce. It only occurs on the uh, certain parts of the extreme south coast, coastal area of um, uh, southern France, south of um, Montpellier and in that, in that region. Um, I've only ever seen it once when um, I visited this site. And um, this is the only upper side shot I could get because it was. Um, uh, um, I think it's a female. It was egg laying on um, uh, some uh, Asclepius species uh, in a, um, an area that was uh, fenced off with a chain link fence. I think it was probably as a sort of bird sanctuary or bird reserve, not the butterflies. So that was the nearest I could get. And that shot was through the chain link fence. But it's a very large and showy butterfly. Um, about the same size as a monarch, not that I've ever seen a monarch, <clears throat> but um, uh, whether it still occurs on the far south of France, uh, I haven't seen any records, so it, it may have disappeared. Um, top right, uh, but certainly not least, is the, the Camberwell Beauty. Um, first named as it was seen in Camberwell in, uh, I think it was 1748, uh, when Camberwell was a rural area, and I think um, there have been something like 2,000 records since, and there have been um, Camberwell Beauty years, uh, given most of them arrive on the, on the East Coast. So they're presumably coming from Scandinavia, but there'll be people in the audience that know more about this than I do. I think the last big year was um, 500 in, in 1995 arrived. And in France, it overwinters in the oak forest in the, uh, in the far south of France, um, in the water area. Uh, but I have to say that in April and May, we do see quite a few. They're, they, they're showing signs of, of wear having overwintered in the forest, um, but we do see quite a few. In one year, we managed to see 13 in different places. But I have to say, we have never seen the next generation of fresh ones in that area at all. So what happens I suspect that they head north towards um, more uh, higher altitudes. Um, the, um, when you do see them on the ground, they are like poplar abril and other large species, very nervous. So really you have to see them before they see you um, because if they see you and they're spooked, they are off very quickly. Um, I'm pretty sure this one is a female, and given that it's on the ground, it's presumably taking moisture from the ground. Um, next, um, marbled whites. We only have one in, in, uh, in Britain, um, but there are four in France. Um, on the top line, uh, the, the marbled white, um, Galathea. Um, the male is uh, top left. Um, 
it's uh, slightly darker than you'd probably expect. There is a, a dark form that occurs in southern France called Procida, which is much darker than this, almost, almost completely black. But I would say this is probably halfway to Procida. And then the female in the middle is probably untypically very white um, for, um, for Galathea. And uh, top right, you have a typical male underside, uh, this sort of quite neatly marked uh, underside. And bottom right is the um, form Leucomelus of Galathea, where the underside is devoid of, um, of any markings at all, is totally plain white. Um, these are not, given that um, Galathea is incredibly common in France, um, uh, you probably get, you see quite a few leucomelus, probably one in 500, one in a thousand. Um, but um, I don't believe that form occurs in Britain, or I haven't heard of anybody who said that they've seen that form in Britain. Um, bottom left and in the middle are the uh, rarest of this uh, group of four, uh, Esper's marble white of um, south central France. And that's a, uh, a female underside there. In fact, <clears throat> with the underside of the um, uh, Melanagia species, the, the females tend to be slightly yellower than the males. And actually, you can, if you can see just, it's, uh, it's uh, in copula with a male, which is actually at 90 degrees. Uh, so uh, he's very carefully got out of shot, but you can just see a bit of wing and antennae. And uh, here are the other two members, because I think this is such an appealing family, it's worth showing all four. Um, the Iberian marbled white, um, uh, male on the left and the other side up, uh, top right. Uh, obviously an Iberian species which sort of spills into part of southwestern France. And on the bottom line, uh, the rather confusingly named western marbled white, um, which is um, uh, an Iberian species, but spreads sort of further eastwards in, um, in the far south of France, but is uh, very appealing, not only the upper side, but also the underside with these rather sort of delicate chocolate brown uh, coloration to the veins. Um, this um, top left and top right uh, and bottom left, Mazarine blue, um, when I was young, sort of seven or eight, and first getting into butterflies, you read the books on Mazarine Blue, which did occur in Britain uh, a few times in the 1800s. And uh, I have to say, it always rather transfixed me. And I always, when we went on holidays to Sussex, I always looked out for it, but was always disappointed. But um, it's relatively common in France, especially at high altitudes. Um, but it's, uh, it's quite easy to spot because it's a much darker, deeper blue than uh, most of the other blows that it flies in company with. And the female is top right, uh, just a smattering of blue scales and blue hairs around the body, but uh, quite appealing nonetheless. And the, um, the underside, bottom left, uh, which is quite a brownish underside, it's quite a variable underside from, uh, even for the males, the, the ground color varies quite enormously. Um, and bottom right um, is a uh, uh, black hair streak, which I have to say is as scarce and as localized in France as it is in England. And uh, <clears throat> I'll confess that that was a photograph that I took in uh, um, a couple of years ago in June at uh, Glapthorne Meadows, where I was delighted to have this beautifully fresh, what I believe is a female um, posing at, at head height. And my previous efforts in France have been uh, postage stamp sized photos of something that's about uh, three or four meters up in the bushes. But um, it's, it's, say it's scarce in France, but uh, uh, in the southeastern half of France, but uh, rather strange that nowhere in between, given that um, it's such a uh, highly localized species. Um, <clears throat> These two are the um, uh, high altitude uh, fritillaries of the uh, Baloria genus, uh, mountain fritillary on the left top and bottom and shepherd's fritillary on the right. They are very, very similar um, in terms of the, the upper side, especially the, only the males, the females are, are significantly different. Um, but um, 
uh, confusingly, they do often fly together uh, at 2000 meters plus, but where they do fly together, the shepherd's fritillary is usually flying at, uh, at, at higher altitude. It, it's said that the, the markings of the mountain fritillary are finer and thinner than shepherd's fritillary, but these markings do vary quite considerably. But the one thing that I've found from the upper side, and as you can see from the undersides, the, the subtlety of the mountain fritillary uh, colouring uh, is, is, is rather more subtle, rather more contrasted for the shepherd's fritillary. These are probably quite extreme examples, though, um, and not necessarily true for every uh, individual. But the, the, the key identifier oops, uh, that's, uh, that, um, that I find is that for the mountain fritillary, where you've got these six spots uh, in the um, submarginal region, they, they tend to be almost continuous, whereas for shepherd's fritillary, there's a slight discontinuity. Now, this seems to be reasonably constant, but probably not absolute, but I've found it's a, it's a good way where there is an element of doubt of, of deciding, but um, there's a number of these species that uh, a number of these individuals where it's probably like many um, Pegasus grizzled skippers, it's probably impossible to tell precisely what they are for certain. And um, it's not all butterflies. This is an oleander hawk moth, uh, freshly hatched. And um, this is where I run out of words. Uh, not only because it's the last slide, but because I just can't think of any words to describe this. It is the most breathtakingly beautiful and intricate insect I've ever seen. And even five years later, it leaves me gobsmacked when I look at it. Um, probably one of the best days I've ever had. Anyway, I said a run out of words, so uh, I'll finish there. Thank you for listening. Well, thanks, Roger. That was um, really interesting talk. I, I learned a lot um, listening to you um, with that. Um, perhaps if we um, end the screen sharing, we can um, then have a um, people can start looking at. Um, see if you can unmute your um, self and try. We can try and get more um, more people on the screen. Hopefully. <laughs> Let's see. I think we're still screen sharing, aren't we? Um, no, we're still seeing you. <laughs> right. Stop share. Yeah. Okay. Hey, that's it. Brilliant. Um, OK, I, I just wanted to say um, before we get on to questions um, that we, we mentioned um, about the, um, the checkered skippers in uh, Fine Shade Wood in Northamptonshire. I, I was on a call yesterday where I was told that butterfly conservation are, are in the process of recruiting um, a couple of temporary staff who are going to be um, have the job of uh, marshalling people that want to go and see the um, the, 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 the English checkered skipper population this, this summer. Um, so the intention is that there will be um, uh, tour, tours available at the site, but clearly there's a, there's a real concern to make sure not too many people go there and that the site doesn't get damaged. So um, probably the best thing ra rather than just pile up there is, is to keep an eye out um, for any, any walks that are advertised. Pro there'll, there'll probably be something in Busfly magazine and we'll certainly make sure it goes on the branch website as well as soon as there's any news. Um, but uh, uh, as was said, it, it is the intention of, of um, organising public access to the site this year. But it, 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 for obvious reasons, we want to be really careful that we don't do anything that's actually going to disturb the uh, the butterfly population. So that's um, that's a very exciting development. Um, now, do we have any questions for Roger? Would anyone like to? Um, unmute and ask a question. Have we got anything in the chat box, Liz? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I'd like a question. Okay, go ahead. I'm Ken Bailey. Um, you mentioned that the mountain mountain all can blue. What what's the Latin name? Is that the Rebeli? Yes. <clears throat> ah, yeah. thank you. Ah, I was wondering. Bencaris yeah. Alcon Rebelli. Yeah. yeah. Good. Thank you. Lovely, lovely, lovely talk. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I've got no quest actual questions. I did post the link to the next Zoom talk um, some way up, so it's in the chat room, the Eventbrite link to the Big City Butterflies talk. Um, otherwise, it was just people saying hello. Oh, um, someone said we have Matt regularly in, ooh, it's in Brittany, near um, Maelstrot. Uh, Will Jackson to everyone. Maybe he can pronounce um, the French names better than I can. Uh, yeah, that's of interest, Roger. Can I ask a question? If the map bus fly has an early spring brood, what does it overwinter? What stage does it overwinter as? Uh, it, it overwinters as some um, uh, non-adult form. But I couldn't tell you which. I don't egg, caterpillar, or chrysalis. Okay. Thank but you. the uh, but the spring form comes out around um, April time. So so it has to feed up quick if it's a. That makes you think it overwinters as a pupa, then doesn't it? I suppose. Uh, well, I, to be honest, I don't actually know exactly in what form <laughs> it uh, it overwinters. But more, uh, more research needed. <laughs> yes. Could I just ask something? Um, hello? Um, yeah, yeah, um, go ahead. Somebody put up a message saying there was an article about the checkered skippers somewhat in, has appeared recently. I, and uh, I couldn't read what it all said. Uh, it says there's an article and a video on the butterfly conservation website. Right, I, I get that, that will mean the national one rather than the branch website, I'm thinking. Okay, thank you. I had a question about, um, well, perhaps about map butterfly, but maybe more than that, Roger. Um, I mean, we are doing a lot of advice to, to landowners now in, 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 in and around uh, London and um, on what plants to plant for butterflies. And um, we, do, we do make a point of trying to get people to think ahead in terms of how, particularly when they're planting trees, as to what sort of plants are going to be um, good in the future when we perhaps have a warmer climate than we have now but I was just wondering whether um, if we were if, if you thought it was likely that we'd ever get map butterflies coming over to this country I mean we, we if, whether it's worth um, advising landowners to plant nettle trees um, they sound a bit prickly um, but um, or indeed any, any other plants that we might be planting now with the, in the hope that they'll attract um, more exotic species of butterflies in the future. But net, nettle tree is, um, is for um, nettle tree butterfly. We, we wouldn't get that here. It's, it's very much a southerly species. OK. Um, but uh, map, um, I, I don't know how far um, from Calais, as it were, that um, you, when you first encounter map, but um, uh, the, the, the problem is in northern France is an awful lot of that is is, is highly agriculturalized and it's probably going to be difficult for species that are probably reasonably sedentary in nature and not migratory to actually sort of cross that, let alone cross the channel. Mm. So, according to yeah, sorry. according to Wikipedia, the Pupa of this is going back to the map. The pupa of the last brood hibernates. Right, so it's pupil. Mm. According to Wikipedia. That's my experience too. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the species that we've had reported in um, in our area in recent years includes things like the long-tailed blue. Um, mm. Um, Camberwell Beauty. We have had Queen of Spain fritillary as well. In fact, I, I saw one of my well, those myself once, although it was in the Channel Islands, which I guess is not is slightly not uh, well nearer, nearer France than England. Um, but I'm I'm get, I'm thinking those those sort of species are probably the most likely ones to um, to get a foothold over here if um, if we do get more butterflies. 
we seem so far to be benefit climate change seems to be producing more more more, more moth species to us than butterflies but given that, given how many extra moth species there are compared to butterflies that's perhaps not that surprising right i found an, there's another um question well um message in chat from Chris to everyone. You referred to a lot of high altitude species. Do you know what stops them spreading to lower altitudes, perhaps further north where temperatures are similar? Um, well, I mean, the problem with a lot of species is that they, they have very specific temperature requirements, very, very narrow temperature requirements. I mean, we've seen the problem in, in um, in Britain with the um, mountain ringlet, which I believe, and there'll be people in the audience who know that better than, better than me, so please correct me if I'm wrong, that it's moving up in terms of altitude in, or, in order to maintain its uh, strict temperature requirements. Um, but a lot of these species have adapted to high altitudes. The, the thing I find very puzzling is that you get a lot of species, for instance, like uh, I believe Glandon Blue, uh, which is alpine and occurs in Fenescandia. And I think you've got species like um, cranberry blue, which is a species of Fenescandia and, and the Alps, but nowhere in between. So it's, it would appear to be largely a temperature requirement and they can't tolerate um, uh, an increase in temperature. Right. Do we do we have anyone else that would like to um, to ask a question before we um, close for this evening? Could, could I just mention that there's been a colony of large tortoiseshells in Dorset um, on Portland for the last few years. Um, whether it'll remain there, uh, we don't know yet. But they certainly over overwintered and bred the following year for about three three or four years. Yes, I saw. I saw there were quite a few sightings reported from there, and I, I think it. Um, it's how it, however it got there in the first place. It seems oh, to have right. become uh, <laughs> become established, but it, it's certain, it's certainly a butterfly that could migrate across the channel. So it, it's um, it's credible that it's um, it's occurred naturally. Although we do know that with all these species, there are people that go around and release them, which um, is quite quite a confusion when you're when you're doing doing recording i think there's been some migrants in norfolk as well they've had a few sightings um one other comment um stephen lowe just said that an article on checkered skipper at the north ant site appeared on last mm. week's bird guides online magazine this will obviously be seen by many thousands of people so i think butterfly conservation better be prepared <laughs> can we ask a question from uh, exotic berlin in germany Please do, yes. Yeah. Um, I had never thought about the distribution of maps before, but given what Roger just said about the temperature requirements of species occurring both in Fennoscandinavia and the Alps, which is quite some distance between, um, why would the map not jump across uh, the channel? I mean, in Berlin, we have maps, both, colon uh, both um, <coughs> versions. We have checkered skippers, we have the fritillaries, uh, we have the um, emperors, both the little and the large, <clears throat> they're even within the city, and various other things that you described for France. Um, and in Berlin, we definitely have a continental climate, worse during winter and worse during the summer. So this, I fail to understand. I fail to understand it too. Uh, um, one of the things that um, I find extremely puzzling and I uh, was rash enough to agree to do a talk on butterfly behavior next month. And that's one of the things I'm gonna have to sort of look into there is that, as I say, in, in Provence, um, the far Southeast corner of France, uh, I think uh, the department of VAR itself has something like 170 species, but certain species do not do not fly there. I mean, a couple of, for instance, is you, you get it's quite scarce, but you get lesser purple emperor, but you don't get purple emperor. You get Cleopatra, but you don't get brimstone. You don't get map. Uh, you get pearl border fritillary, but not small pearl bordered. And you get a lot of these sort of twins. And you'd have thought that uh, an, an area like Provence, with its incredible sort of diversity of terrain and its richness, um, it's it, difficult to see any reason why 
certain species would not. I mean, why would Mac not move to uh, the southeast corner of France? It'd be much easier than getting to Britain. But um, I think these things are, you can only assume that maybe the temperatures are too hot. You get strange things that we still don't fully understand. For instance, um, in, in Provence, uh, grayling are uh, supposed to emerge in June, but personally, I never see any in July and August. And it's said that they east debate and uh, reappear in September when the temperature's cooler. Whether this is true, <laughs> there are so many things we don't understand, but uh, they, 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 one of my questions really is, given these species say like cranberry blue, which occurs in, in a Fenescandia and, um, and in the Alps at uh, sort of 1800 meters plus, were these once connected? Uh, they must've been at once connected what, what happened after the last ice age? Uh, as I say, this um, the talk on, on behavior, I've started to look at it and, and frankly, there's more questions than answers. Good, well. Um, I look forward to your talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be a great talk because asking the right questions is even more interesting perhaps if they're accompanied by nice pictures at least. Yeah, well, we've um, we've had some good questions today. Are there is there anyone else wants to ask a question before we um, say thank you to Roger? I think you should be very proud because I think we've had our highest attendance. Great. Well, good thank week. you, thank you ever so much, everyone that has come. We've really. Um, I think we've probably all learned a lot this evening. Um, as I said at the start, and our next talk is on Tuesday next week, which is on the uh, the big city butterflies, bringing conservation and, and education on butterflies into into central London. Um, we've got the two uh, two two staff members who are working on the project who are going to be talking, Steve Bolton and Ellie Johnson. So it should be really interesting. They've been making fantastic strides on the on the project in its first year and still got another three years to go um, so if you would like to do that then then book in on the uh, eventbrite link which is uh, accessible on the, the the branch website and also on the emails we've been sending around to uh, hearts and middlesex me members but um every, everyone from european butterflies group is also very welcome to come to that if you'd like to um, so that just leaves me to say thank you ever so much to roger um, Another excellent talk as always, and um, we'll uh, see you all um, next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.